Hello, my name is Jonathan Swift, the Content Director of the InfroPro Insurance Division. I'd like to welcome you to the latest insurance COVID cast, number 28, if you've been counting. And the second focused around the campaign we've launched for insurance post called The Future of Insurance Work, where today we'll be focusing on managing return to work risks. Now I'm delighted to say, joining me for today's conversation, we have Sam Franks, the UK Regional Development Manager at Beasley, Sean Kelly, the Chief Ethics Officer at Crawford and & Company and Deputy President of the Chartered Institute of Loss Justice, John Keppel, the COO of Zurich UK, Nathan Shanahi, the COO of Aon UK, and finally, Tony Tarquini, Director of Insurance EMEA at Pegasystems. Welcome all. Thank you. Hi, Thank right. you. Thanks. So my first question, and I'll come to you first on this, Tony, is how, how do you manage any reticent stress and anxiety in staff returning to the office space? And what steps can be taken to reassure employees it is safe to travel to and from and also work at the office? So I think the, the two most important words there are trust and confidence. They're going to be absolutely crucial going forward that staff have to believe that you're looking after their interests. Um, you know, there's always been a duty of care, um, but that's going to have um, much greater legal implications um, and going forward. Um, I think what we've got to remember here is that you can't just turn the tap on and bring everyone back to work one day you know, like before. Um, not all employees have the same skill sets and qualifications. And then there's a whole series of other considerations. So from a, a personal and work circumstances point of view, um, you know, there's the anxiety around child care and other family issues, financial health and well-being considerations, um, you know, as well as the usual uh, op occupational health and, and safety uh, logistics. One of those could be, for example, distancing in call centres. So the British standard for fire regulations requires the minimum distance between desks to be around about 60 centimetres. Now, usually the space is wider than that, probably about a metre. Um, but that's still half the required COVID distance requirements. So that could half the numbers of people even if the screen has been elected. Then you've got the community work. Um, employers will be urged to stagger shifts and start times, um, and there will be alternating teams or on site, um, and that's all designed to, to help um, time public transport services, which are probably something like or less. Um, uh, and and you know you've got the the um, bottlenecks around entrances and, and screening stations, etc. You've got to think about workplace, knowing where to start lunch, um, timing and location, you know, workplaces in, in remote locations rely on um, uh, having a, a cafeteria or whatever to, to be able to take those breaks. So, you know, the resilience survey that um, was published in Post last week was saying that something like 25% of insurance staff felt that they would never return to their pre-lockdown working hours in the office. So I think there's some quite significant impact on staff capacity planning on work allocation and, and frankly clearing the backlog that's that, that's come out over over the um, furlough period so insurance uh, companies are going to need a much more agile technology from what i'm looking at from a technology perspective which is capable of mixing workers with with different skills some on site some working from home alternating shifts out of sync working at different times um, for, for the rest of their team and and actually the truth of the matter is most policy admin systems and claims ad systems, which insurers use, have hard-coded sequential tick list processes to get the work done. Now, you know, that's pretty inefficient and in most cases, uh, in many cases anyway, if ineffective at, at best of times. And if you exacerbate that with this kind of situation, it's going to be very difficult. So insurers have to resist the temptation to put their staff at risk because they need to get the work done, but their IT isn't up to the job. So we've We've been seeing you know, a significant increase in insurers wanting to talk to us about intelligent work allocation and execution, which will allow staff to get their work done going forward, but within these kinds of work patterns. So the need you know, for, for agility, for, for automation, uh, for intelligent work um, uh, processes and flexible guided processes. And so that's, that will allow companies to get the work done without compromising staff getting back to, to work and safety. So I've got a couple of examples of where that duty of care um, is being clearly demonstrated, if, 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 that, if that's helpful. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, one of them is Google. 
Um, you know, if they haven't been busy during this lockdown period, I don't know who has. Um, but they came to us and uh, and they asked us about using our technology to protect their engineers. Um, they've got engineers across thousands of locations in something like 50 countries and visiting independent data centers, which host those Google servers. Um, and in particular, it's around um, the building of the network for Google Meet, which is an online conferencing system, which is sort of similar to Zoom. Um, and during lockdown, Google's seen something like a 30 times increase in, in demand for the service. So they had two major priorities. The first one was to keep their people safe. And the second was to ensure that their customers got, obviously, the best quality service that they, they, they could get. They fundamentally changes the way that Google segregates and deploys these engineers. Um, and it had to limit the, the range of Google locations where they work um, in order to sort of minimize the risk of catching the, and spreading the virus. So the company was able to create the application in Pega from scratch in less than a week. And they're now developing a, a tracing app in, in case of infections. Um, so that's the kind of technology which is going to reassure, reassure employees that it's safe to go back to work and that they're being properly cared for. Um, second example is with an insurance company um, in, in, the, in the US, I've got to say, but um, it's uh, Aflac, um, which has something like 50 million critical illness um, and life and accident policyholders who are mainly in the US and, and Japan. But um, they've given their staff a whole raft of new technology to help them concentrate on raising the, the customer satisfaction while the company is reading from the pandemic. So, you know, pretty well at pace that they re-engineered their claims app um, and that allows their policy holders um, to, to register a claim without having to remember their user IDs or passwords or, or, or anything like that. So Aflac uses the internal data to identify the right insurance policy and, and, and policy holder. So they've also created a, um, a claims tracker to keep track of claims. So policyholders can use that to, um, uh, to, to track their claims. And they've used Pega to automate and speed up the claims process and make it easier for staff to, to process payments. So the result has been a lot less um, work and a lot less stress for both the staff and for the claimants. So you know they were in the process of developing a live chat service for their customers when, when the um, COVID-19 struck. And they fast-tracked that. Um, and in just a few weeks, they scaled it right across their business and then added some. I think we might be losing you there, Tony. Okay. Sorry, I might be fading out, fading back in again. Yeah, I feel it's uh, like... probably only going <laughs> to last for a few seconds. But, you know, I'll just finish and say, you know, that's an example of um, necessity being the mother of invention to protect staff and get the work done. Yeah. OK. Sam, can I ask what the experience is like at, um, at Beasley? Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, of course. So um, for my office in, in Birmingham, we've got uh, 100 or so people and you know, we're all successfully working remotely at the moment. But of course, you know, as, as Tony's already touched on, different people are experiencing the lockdown in different ways with um, with perhaps uh, for some people actually not having the commute is actually quite welcome. But then homeschooling responsibilities and caring for caring for vulnerable people or um, shielding due to health conditions. Um, and you know, some people, let's let's face it, uh, at the start of their careers, perhaps you know, living in shared houses and effectively confined to their bedroom to work. So there's a, there's a whole range of different individual experiences. And in terms of um, helping people um, with to manage that return to work anxiety and stress, um, I'd, I'd highlight two things. One is very much listening, is very much understanding people's individual circumstances and working out as a business, how can we how are we best placed to support that individual and what flexibility and tools can we bring to help them with their return to work? And secondly, is around communication. So I know Tony's already touched on all the, 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 the many health and safety and risk assessment requirements to, to again, reassure everybody that, that the workplace is going to be safe. But I, I don't think you can over communicate. I think it's it's going to be very, very important for us to uh, be really clear about how we can, how we're working hard to make sure it's as safe as possible for people to return to the office. Sure. Um, I, th I think all I can do is, is agree with what's been said before. I think it's around uh, planning communication and training and through all of that consultation um, and, and I can talk about each in depth but won't but in terms of the planning you have to consult with with folks to understand um, why they may be reticent to return to work and and that could be a combination both of COVID and the fact that that now employer and employees have, have now welcomed and um, now embrace working from home and I think um, counter the skeptics out there 
Um, but we we um, have done a survey of the UK staff. We've had a, a surprisingly good 94% um, response rate. And I think there's only about 4% who say that they're unhappy with working from home. Um, and what we need to do is do the follow up with them to understand why they are, because who returns to an office is not just about who management want to return, but who may have a need to return around the fact that they live alone. They may have mental health issues or whatever, but all of that is built into the planning. And then, as I say, you you communicate and then you train. And there's obviously a, a large number of things we need to do in order to do that return to work framework that then informs the risk assessment. Nathan. Yeah, like, uh, I probably echo everything that's been said so far. I mean, we were fortunate that we had a 100% agile environment to start with, but I think probably a thing that's very, very clear is it, it's actually going to be easier to go into lockdown than it is to come out of lockdown. Mm. Um, I think I think it's really clear from my perspective that for every good piece of communication you do, it can be interpreted in a, in a negative way. You have to put colleagues at the heart of absolutely everything you do to make sure that actually from a, a, a well-being perspective, not only colleagues, um, but third parties that work for you, but actually them and their families, you know, to make sure that you actually are really broad enough in your consideration of the vulnerabilities that everyone is trying to consider. And, you know, from 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 our perspective, the, the whole strategy has really been driven by making sure that we engage thoroughly, we go through proper risk assessments, and in our in our instance, because because we're able to work um, pretty much 100% from home, um, it means that actually we're we're driving it based on demand. So it's really about where colleagues have a need to come back to the office be, to support them and to support what they need around the, the you know making making their position and their ability to work sort of better and their family environment better. So and I think that is critical for everyone. I, I also agree with the, the rest of the, the the guys in terms of the, the feedback that I think when agile working has been looked at before, the manifestation of agile working has been you either work from home or you work remotely. And I, I think there is going to be a real new norm, which is you don't wear one or the other as an outcome. You mm -hmm. actually, it will be ultimately uh, an opportunity for us to be in the office when we need to be and actually make our lives easier working remotely when that makes sense to do so so and in terms of travel i think it's it's absolutely a key consideration um everything that the the guys have said around around the ability to get to the office we are focusing a lot of our energy on making sure that um, cycle provisions, car park provisions, all of those things are in place that just make it easier for people to work through. Obviously, anything around office utilization, don't come in five days a week if you don't need to, work off peak times, etc. So all really straightforward stuff, but hopefully in the aggregate will give people the confidence that, that they can return safely if they choose to do so. And finally, I'll come to you, John. What's the experience at Zurich? Uh, so kind of like Nathan mentioned there, we've been able to operate very effectively during during lockdown and, and, and extremely grateful for for the support of many hardworking colleagues across the business to make sure that was the case. But um, I think in terms of dealing with stress and anxiety in, in staff around returning, you know, I'd kind of echo some of Sam's comments. It's about a continuous open dialogue. I think the the honesty in that dialogue is important. It's it's not a normal communication, you know, em employer to employee. It, it, it's quite a personal one. Uh, it involves personal decision making and personal circumstances with, you know, as has been mentioned, childcare, schooling, you know, looking after looking after other members of family or community. So there's a lot going on in people's lives. Um, I think we've been able to maintain a good, honest dialogue, but I'd also agree with some of the other comments. You, you know, you can't communicate enough. Like Sean, we surveyed the, the community in Zurich as part of our return to work data gathering and um, and, and the take up rate with that survey, I think, 
you know, outstrips any survey we've ever tried to do. Yeah. Normally, normally people complain extremely loudly that they're being over surveyed. This one, I think we had 1700 respondents in 48 hours, um, you know, over 2000 within a few days. Uh, so people are extremely keen to share their perspectives and, and we wanted to make sure that they could do so in a way that, you know, frankly, they could just say what they thought, not necessarily answer a set of Fed questions. So we've got some great insight from what people want. I think, you know, we're working closely with with partners in the industry, you know, like Aon and, and making sure that we know what we're what we're both doing. You know, when, when do our when do our broker facing staff need to be in offices? Um, we've approached the return to work through two lenses. Either there's a business need, which which might well be being discussed, you know, with with broker partners and, and others in the industry, or there may be a process that that really, frankly, could be better served in the office. We we have very very few of those. I'm glad to say. And then the secondary point that I think Sean and Sam raised around well-being. You know, there are there are individuals within our organization who would be far more comfortable um, working from the office. So that's the way we're approaching it. I think maintaining that openness of dialogue. I don't think you can talk enough. I think it's important to listen about twice as often as you talk. Um, you know, I think the fortunate thing is that we've we've had a very positive experience of working from home. We've kind of broken the glass, I think, a little bit on on this whole myth that we can't possibly do this. Um, we've been trying to do it, frankly, for years uh, with relatively modest take up. Um, you know, we're, we're now dealing with exactly the reverse, uh, as, a, as a number of the guys have talked about, that um, it, it may appear that we have some some footprint that we need to do something different with in the future. So can I ask, John, I mean, how do you re-engage with employees who, who might have been furloughed for months and, and what employment practice legislation should should employees be aware of in returning to the office? Yeah, well, I'm glad to say I don't have the furlough problem because yeah. we didn't furlough anybody, so um, we, we've we've kept everybody we've kept everybody busy, thankfully. So that wasn't a, a problem that we have to overcome. Um, but certainly, I think in terms of in terms of the return to work practices, it's much more about maintaining a safe working environment. Tony touched on some of the legislation and risk assessments that need to be done. Um, you know, we we need to make sure that we've got um, the right safety environment and safe environment for people to work in. And then, you know, back to question one, we've got to reassure them of that and communicate that with people so that they understand what it's going to look like, how it's going to feel different, because we've certainly been battling a little bit against, uh, you know, I want to go back mentality in, a, in, in, in some populations. And we've been saying, well, I don't think you're going to recognize what you're going to go forward to because we're not going back. Um, <laughs> It's going gonna, it's gonna to look and feel very different in the interim. Um, we, we've obviously, like a lot of other businesses, been preparing offices for socially distanced working, um, talking to staff about what that's going to look and feel like, um, but obviously making sure that at all times, you know, with a duty of care in mind, we've, we've got a safe environment for, for, for those relatively few employees that are likely to be in the office in the coming months to, um, to work with. Sam? Yeah, I mean, uh, similar to, to John, whilst we didn't have any furloughed um, members of staff, I mean, for, for businesses that are bringing their fellow staff back to the office, be that, you know, on a part time or, or a full time basis, you know, I would have I would expect that they're, they're going to be looking very clear, closely at how they re-engage and yes, how that how things are different now, what what training and what skills are going to be needed to to help those individuals get back into the workplace and the workplace that was that was different from what they experienced before. So um, so. Yeah, absolutely planning for that and particularly the training and perhaps thinking about what what training can be done remotely now what can be done online that's going to help uh, those team members uh, make the transition as easy as possible i mean i suppose linked to that in terms of um, uh, legal risks or things to be conscious of i mean uh, so we've talked about flexibility so if people's place of work is different if their hours are different if there's something uh, uh, different about their their job role as a result of this then you know there's there's clearly things that need to be thought about from an employment contract perspective so um, organizations looking at looking at what advice they've got what in-house resources or what expertise they need to bring in to help them through those sorts of decisions and then similarly we we've been talking about flexibility for people with 
children that need to be homeschooled or perhaps people with um, health problems or people who are older or people with a disability um, people who are pregnant you know, these are all these are all protected characteristics under under legislation as well so how the um, how reasonable adjustments are made to help those people return to work or, or, or frankly not return to work, to continue to um, not come to work, need to be very carefully thought out to make sure that the business is, is navigating these in a, you know, both being fair and, and engaging with their workforce, but also being mindful of, of the potential legal traps they could fall into. Yeah. Tony? So, um, yeah, I, I reiterate a lot of what everybody's said, but um, I think we also need to think on, on, a, on a wider scale as well, uh, a macro scale and a micro scale. So, you know, big questions um, which are going to be affecting people's ability to get back to work um, from their employer's point of view is, you know, what, what's the business going to look like post return? Um, you know, what changes are there in, in expectations and capabilities, um, both from, from customers and their expectations and capabilities and, and your own organisation? Um, how is the business going to respond to an economic downturn? So we you know, saw um, a, a minus 20% um, effect on the UK uh, um, economy uh, reported last week. What's that going to uh, result in uh, as we go through the next through a few months and, and, and the next year? Um, and then you know, what the business is doing around um, changes to continuity planning. I think there's a lot of le lessons being learned over the last few months. Um, so what happens if there's a potential second wave? Um, or even a, you know, the next pandemic, are we geared up to being able to deal with that? And, and what does that mean? And, and are we thinking strategically enough about um, how we would have to do things differently? So, you know, is the business ready and able to be a, an agile and, and probably mostly virtual workplace in the longer term? So there's a lot of strategic decisions up there. Um, but if you dive down into the detail, uh, another dimension is that, you know, insurers are gonna need to, um, to manage the requirements for for refresh refresher training for people um so those people who are returning to work are going to go through the same sort of um muscle memory um issues um that you get when you've returned from from a holiday you know you've been away for two weeks you had a great time you come back into the office and you think oh yeah uh where do i normally keep that where does that do and where do i go over here all of these things are a little bit strange i mean if you take the aviation industry for example um, pilots who are, are flying planes um, and they haven't flown a particular kind of plane for some weeks or months uh, are not allowed to just go straight in and start flying them as though that you know that, that they um, they did it every day they have to change the processes and they have to in some cases go on refresher training before they can start flying the plane again. so you know there's there's a lot of um, categories of people so you have people who are who are returning from furlough um, I mean, clearly there's, there's going to be those who are, are not. And, you know, we're already starting to see um, layoffs being announced. Um, All state in the US has, has already said they're laying off thousands of people. Now, we might say, OK, that doesn't affect the, the, U, the UK, but actually they've got two and a half thousand staff in Northern Ireland. So they're probably going to be affected as well. So it is going to hit the UK, um, you know, particularly where those people coming back from furlough have been involved in doing other work in the meantime. So they may need to be retrained. Um, reorientation of new starters who just started before furlough, worked for a few weeks or even a couple of months, and then had to, to, to stop doing that work. They're going to have to go back into that again. Um, people who are new starters during the last few months, um, and of course, you know, things haven't stopped. There's been introduction of new systems and, and new processes um, int introduced um, during the last, last few months, which people are going to have to get to grips with as well. So, you know, the world is, will not look the same when you go back into the office. There will be people who are no longer there. There will be new people starting. There will be new ways of working. Lots of new things for, for people to think about. Sean? Uh, I, I suppose my immediate response to the question was that we shouldn't be re-engaging those people on furlough because we should have been engaging with them all along. Um, the thought that people on furlough were just cast uh, out to their homes for a period of time and had uh, no communication with their manager and colleagues for a period of time is, is something that scares me. And, and I'd like to think that didn't occur. I, I think it's been incumbent on businesses and managers to engage with them. Um, I, I think they, um, they should have had IT connectivity, clearly not to work, but to keep up to date with with um, internet announcements and things around the dynamics in the business. And um, I, I think they should have been involved in um, social occasions. I think we've all now got used to a five o'clock cocktail hour by teams or um, team quizzes. 
and and there's absolutely no reason why they they shouldn't have been engaged with those so as i say for me it, it's not about the re-engagement so much as the continuation of engagement with them albeit that when they do return as as other people have said there is a need to to uh, remind them and uh, refresh them in terms of what may have happened in the dynamics in the business during their their absence finally i'll come to you nathan yeah so again uh, we we were fortunate enough to not be in a position to need to to furlough colleagues just because of you know the nature of our business and the way our clients and ourselves were able to sort of transition through to remote working um i think I think there's a couple of things that are really important to me in terms of sort of overall engagement, because I think I can't speak specifically about furlough colleagues. Uh, one thing is that at the moment, um, I think there's this feeling of it's, it's return to work. And the one thing that I, my experience tells me is that everyone has been working and possibly harder than harder than most um, during this period. Um, um, someone described it to me the other day as I'm not working from home. I'm I'm sleeping at work. And I think that's a, that's a great way of sort of summarizing. Where Very good. We're at. So, so, yeah. so I think from my perspective, I think it is it is critical that as we open offices, we make sure that actually we've thought through our strategy for the longer term and we start to really think about this as genuinely being an opportunity and there potentially being a real new norm. Um, some things that have been described on the call, such as, the percentages of office, office space that may even be available, et cetera, is going to make the whole environment very different. And I think we really have to think through how we need to use that space to make it work and then how we change our whole engagement plan with people who are at home to make that successful in the medium term. We are onboarding colleagues today in some of whom have never worked before in this you know new environment and you know, we've got to work out how we can make sure they're mentored and trained properly this is a new norm you know looking at our business continuity plans our op resilience plans and genuinely making sure that our organization is reorganized for an unquantified period and we really think about it like that um, because you know even with social distancing time uh, gaps may be coming down etc cetera, etc cetera, we're not going to be in a position where our where our office space is usable in the same form for a significant period of time. And that in truth can, can potentially become a positive because there are an awful lot of digital strategies in the insurance marketplace that have maybe never had such a good chance to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, you know, we've got to capture those things, I think, and actually really look at how we can refresh our strategy refresh our engagement model and build the best of these outcomes into our overall ecosystem and, and, and actually get to the point where we're not thinking about this as a temporary solution, but yeah. we're thinking about how we get the best of this into a long-term solution. And like any you know, company that's doing a good job of leveraging its assets, using all the assets we've got, in the most comprehensive way to deliver our strategies. So can I ask Nathan, what are the potential risks, including liability risks such as DNO, the companies face from getting this wrong? Uh, yeah, so very similar to question one, the, the difficulty here is that, that um, no matter what decision you make, you may have some DNO liability. So um, going yeah. too slow, yeah. Could result in you being perceived as putting um, financials at risk. Going too quick could be perceived as putting colleagues at risk. I think from my perspective, it's about evidencing reasonable steps, making sure you're risk considered in everything you do, and genuinely pushing yourself through a process and making sure that is well communicated to absolutely everyone. And making sure that everyone that, that you are engaging with is notified of the potential risks so that actually there can be no confusion as to the fact that you, you, you are mitigating risks, you're not eliminating risks, and trying to reduce them wherever you can. Being conscious of the fact that, you know, you have a liability for anyone that is in your workplace and just making sure that, again, you're managing the communication around that and managing the activities around that. 
in reality, there are DNO, PI, you know, EPL, cyber, crime risks. I mean, there are a huge number of risks to the revised operating models that everyone's coping with, whether they become short term or long term. Uh, and my advice would be genuinely make sure they're checked. So as you go through the process, make sure that actually the coverage you have in place is fit for purpose for the new norm. As you revise your risk plans, your BCP plans, as you think about all these things that you are changing in how you're organized, you know, in, engage with your risk manager, your broker, whoever it may be, and just make sure that actually all the risks are articulated in the new form and actually are considered, you know, in the coverages you've got. Sean? Uh, I can only echo what's gone before um, and, and what I said earlier. I think it's all to do with planning, communication, training and the consultation piece and and documenting it. Um, you know, fundamentally, um, it needs to be documented, both because the process of documentation helps you to sanity check. But if 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 the worst happens across the whole spectrum of what could go wrong, uh, then um, if you get a visit upon you by a regulator um, or you have a civil civil liability, you can demonstrate that hopefully you took whatever steps that you needed to take to um, mitigate the risks. Sam. Um, so just to build on what's been said, really, so that the, the stakes are pretty high for Drayson offices. The the financial pressures are high. They're trying to navigate a situation that no one's got prior experience of doing. Um, in the SME world, there are still a number of uninsured risks. So insurance brokers have got a really important role to play by highlighting the opportunity to transfer some of that risk. And you know, it's a market going through some change at the moment. So things may be, may be about to get harder. So it could be a great time to um, to advise clients on, on the availability of coverage. I suppose the other angle I bring in is the cyber side. So um, organizations are collecting more personal sensitive data than ever before about the health of their employees and their family and their vulnerabilities and, and disabilities. So the, so both from the data that organizations are holding and you know, we've all gone to remote working in our industry and in other industries as well. So there's more entry points into IT systems than ever before. So there's a the, the, the increase of, of risk in cyber is not going to go away. John. Uh, yeah, um, probably some similar some similar themes. I'm sure Nathan agrees with me. It's a really fun time to be a COO. Um, it, <laughs> it, it's presenting it's presenting some unique career moments for us all. I suspect. Um, I think we you know we went right to risk. That was where we went first. So once we'd established that everybody was safely at home and protected, then a complete operational risk review was what we did because it's kind of what we do, um, you know, to really understand what this new operating environment meant for us and and, and whether or not it had um, a, a material impact on the controls that we have in place and, you know, could we still rely on those controls, etc. I would absolutely agree with the other comments, you know, under the regimes in which we operate, documenting decision making is critical. Um, you know, and is and is frankly common practice. I, I think it serves us well through situations like this, actually. Um, and yes, we, you know, I, I think I sort of share Nathan's thoughts around too fast, too slow. You know, no one's been here before. Getting that right is a tough one. Um, but I think, you know, back to question one, you know, that's what the dialogue is all about, because we're not just we're not just moving at one pace. We're moving at the pace of many, many individuals and teams and different markets and in our business, you know, being a composite insurer. We, we have we have entirely different businesses to, to run, including our engineering inspection business, which, you know, for whom they were key workers, they've been working, you know, every day throughout this. So. You know, so I think in a, in a large corporate environment, there, there's an awful lot of these factors um, that land on the table of people like, uh, you know, people like Nathan and I, unfortunately, um, and we and we have to find a solution to them. But I, I, I do think that there are some new risks, but I think that the practices that we operate as an industry actually, from from my perspective, have served us quite well through this. Uh, finally, I'll come to you, Tony, on this. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I echo the point that we're doing this for the first time we've never come out of lockdown before um and we're feeling our way forward there's things going to happen that we will never ever be able to predict and i'll illustrate that using a, a real example um 
you know, of not being able to screen for and track um, COVID incidents in the, in the workforce. So we, we work with a, a large health, healthcare group who run something like 200 hospitals across the, uh, the USA and the UK. Um, and they use Pegasus technology to, to develop an application to track how many of their staff were reporting in sick during the, the pandemic. So they had a prototype working in about three days, and by the following week, they they fully uh, had a fully working app that their employees could use to report off sick. However, um, they found out by actually doing this, that a third of their hospital workforce, which is something like 12,000 people, were not registered on the previous scheduling system used across the rest of the group to monitor their staff sickness. So, you know, that, that's an awful lot of people who are potentially at risk the liability exposure if you can't screen and track and trace and take care of your employees is you know pretty pretty obvious the duty of care again you know i think it's it's unlikely in the short term that um any workplace is going to feel anything other than unsettling and and, and very sterile and, and a little bit scary um the liability risks um can be forecast yes because i think we've got a lot of experience to build on but only by living through it um, will it tell us what the real exposure actually is? Okay. Well, on that note, I'd like to thank my panel, uh, Tony, Sean, John, Sam, and Nathan. Thank you very much for giving up your time for this. Thanks very much for having us. Thank you. As I mentioned at the start, this is part uh, of an ongoing series that we are having on insurance, post-insurance stage called Insurance Covid Cast. If you'd like to subscribe or register for either title, then please use the tab in the banner up here. But until the next insurance COVID cast, it's goodbye for me and stay safe, everybody. Cheerio. Cheerio. Stay safe. Thanks for having me.